Uh, I'm very happy to be here. As uh, uh, Martin said, I have been working. Uh, the, the last book, that the one that I'm writing now, it's a manifesto uh, uh, for... Uh, okay. <laughs> Manifesto for an Islamic Liberation Theology. I have been working on this for at least uh, 25 years and, and working at the grassroots level, working with uh, Christian and, and with uh, uh, people who have been working on this and, and coming back to the source of uh, this thinking within the Islamic tradition. Uh, for me, what we get when we come to or when we try to understand the uh, Islamic message is something which has to do with the liberation theology and I would say that everything in Islam coming from within has to do with liberation. Now as an introduction uh, let me uh, highlight four points. Uh, for if you come back to the uh, Christian liberation theology and what happened in Latin America very often what is said, and not only said, and, and written about is we are talking about the reading of the poor. So very often is this uh, mixed reading, is this drawing uh, perceptions and approaches coming from the left uh, or the leftist uh, understanding of what is on what should be social dynamics and liberation and social liberation and political liberation to which of course there is this uh, Christian uh, teachings and how using the Christian teaching reading the scriptural sources from this uh, reading of the poor you end up understanding that it's a liberation theology helping the people to free themselves from all types of uh, oppression my take on this is that even though I agree on many of the things that you will find in this approach, uh, experiencing it at the grassroots level in Brazil, in uh, uh, Latin America when I was there, dealing with priests and, and sharing so many things and saying, yes, from an Islamic perspective, I can understand what uh, uh, you are talking about. So. Uh, having said that, how we can, in fact, uh, try to uh, uh, deal with the, the whole uh, issue. From an Islamic perspective, I would say I wouldn't start with a specific interpretation of the reading of the poor, but mainly coming to an understanding which is the spiritual take in the whole issue. So I'm not starting with the poor, I'm not starting with the social construct, I'm starting with the concept of God, the concept of human being, and the concept of the very understanding of what spiritually means from an Islamic perspective. So it's completely different. In fact, I'm not starting from a social perspective, I'm starting with the cosmology. So the cosmology meaning how, from an Islamic perspective, you understand the cosmos and the creation and the oneness of God. So the principle here has to do with uh, with the tawhid, the oneness of God, and then also the way we have to deal with the creation and the way we have to deal with uh, 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 the universe and with our own self. So this is the first point that I wanted to make. If you have read uh, uh, Christian uh, theologians, you will see that uh, the angle is quite different from what I'm trying to do. Even though on our way towards the understanding of liberation, we will see so many shared uh, uh, objectives, shared means, and shared values. This is one. The second is to stop for a while on this cosmology and to try to understand what we are talking about. In fact, from an Islamic perspective, uh, the starting point if, is uh, to come back to a tawhid, the oneness of God. And the oneness of God is essential because out of this understanding of uh, the concept of God from the Islamic perspective, beyond everything that you cannot define, that uh, the only thing that you can say about him is what he's saying about himself. So silence is the first uh, dimension in what you can say 
but it doesn't mean it what you can feel from with it. Because there's something in our tradition saying that from the Islamic perspective, there's something in your being which is a natural, original spark, which is the quest that you have to get an answer why. So there is a question. And the question is not, and it's not uh, something which is a, an intellectual construct. It has to do with our very nature as human beings. I will come back to this. Having said this, from the very beginning, the first occurrence that you have in the Quran with the second chapter is sort of the Baqarah, the cow, is in fact the question the angels are asking uh, uh, about human beings. And saying something which is in fact in the essence, and this is why we don't understand uh, the relationship that we need to have with our own self. When it is said in the Quran, when he is saying, I'm going to put on earth a steward, the, the stewardship is at the vice gerent, somebody, a, a being, which is going to be uh, a vice gerent, he has no ownership on the creation, but he has to manage the creation. And the first question coming from the angels, which is something which has to do with our understanding, are you going to put on earth somebody or a being that could destroy and corrupt and spread blood, bloodshed around? Is this what your intention? What is your intention? I know what you don't know. This is the answer from God to the angel. So this image, this parable from the beginning is saying this. It's saying something which is important. Human beings are the only species able to corrupt, to destroy the whole creation. They can act and behave against themselves. So at the very nature of who we are is that if there is no education, if there is no spirituality and values, if there is no resistance to our own being, so if we don't understand that the starting point of spirituality is liberate yourself from your own being, it's a liberation process from the self, from the ego. So this is the way we have to understand humanity from the, in, within the cosmology. So nature is going to stay. Species are going to stay. Animals are going to stay. The only one that could destroy this nature, that could destroy the universe, is the human being. So you can behave against your own interests. So, in fact, it means that our journey, the spiritual journey, has to do with protecting ourselves from ourselves. How are we going to do that? So, and protecting nature, the environment, the creation from our own behavior. So there is something here which is, if you stick to your nature, if you are trapped in your very nature, if you keep on repeating, it's me, it's natural, it's good, this could be very bad. So nature in itself is not the, uh, the <coughs> it's not home for what is good. Good is going to come out of uh, effort. It takes effort to deal with your own nature to become spiritual. So deal with your natural to become spiritual in order to your spirituality to master your nature and to spread around what is good. And it's there at all the levels, every situation. It comes with yourself, come to your your uh, fellow human being. Uh, when it comes to nature, on the, the the creation. So, this is something which is important because in this cosmology, this understanding of the very nature of human being, it means that spirituality coming back to him, to the one who created the whole nature, means. First, no relationship to God if you don't deal with your own nature through education. So when God comes to humanity, say, read, <coughs> educate yourself. Education is central. So it's a process. You become a human being. You are not like this, a human being. You can be a human beings out of your nature and you destroy everything has to do with education. Education to do what? Education to master your own self. So anything which has to do as a philosophy, you feel it, it's good, do it, that's dangerous. Because it's all about be careful, your very nature, if you follow it, 
can be a distraction of your very So it has to do with the second point, which is uh, 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 education is first, managing is second, to manage, to uh, uh, try to be disciplined with our own self. And then the third process coming out of this is to educate, to manage, means to liberate yourself. So all the, the, everything that has to do with Islam in this cosmology, this understanding is you have to go through a process and your spirituality means educate yourself, manage and control yourself, be able to be disciplined with your own self in order to liberate yourself from your own nature. It's this. It's simple and it takes so much effort just to implement in our daily life. So, having said that, now we come back and defeat the, the third point. I'm still in my introduction, by the way. Uh, uh, the third point, which is uh, important in this process, is uh, okay, what is the message then? What do we have to do? The message is coming and saying, in fact, the Quran is understood as being a risala. A risala means a message. And a risala is also known in Islam as being a noor, light. It's just to bring you to light from your, per, your potential darkness to the divine light. This is what we are trying to do. The message is about this. It's a risala helping you to go or to manage the potential darkness of your being to the spiritual light of His presence. This is the very meaning of the spiritual journey. So you can see here that I'm not talking about the social construct to start with the reading of the poor. It's coming back to the self. Why? Because I can see that some who are very close to the poor are still trapped in anything which has to do with cultural dependency, economic misunderstanding, political structure, and even the media. So if we don't start with the being, we can be lost as to what is the final goal of this struggle for liberation. So it's spiritual first, and it's spiritual as a necessity for achieving the individual but also the collective liberation. So this message is uh, it's a uh, risala, it's a message dealing with and talking about light and light is quite interesting because light is everywhere in the Quran. Allah nur samawati wal ard. God is the light of the uh, the uh, heavens and, and the earth. But also the Quran is light and what we are trying to achieve is light in ourselves. So the quest for life is the quest for Meaning is the quest, is the meaning of life. The meaning of life is a quest for light. We are, uh, our quest is for Him, God is light. It's for our own uh, salvation, which is part of this life. So we also have to think about light is what? Is liberating ourselves from what I said, our potential dark sides that we, every one of, know, uh, every one of us, know exactly what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about your potential darkness. You don't need to get a mufti or a priest or a teacher to get this. Just take a mirror, a spiritual mirror, and it will, it will talk about it. So here, what is important is this quest for, uh, uh, for uh, meaning, this quest for light that we have, it's uh, this quest for Nur, Nurun ala Nur, and you can see that a Nur is the meaning of the, it's first God, is the meaning of the message, it's coming back to your own heart, it's coming back to love, it's coming back to all these dimensions are um, surrounded by the very notion of Nur in the Quran and Nur in all the prophetic traditions. And by the way, we find this everywhere in all the spiritualities and in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam. So, uh, and then we have to deal with our mind, and we have to deal with our heart, and we have to deal with uh, our uh, own being to do what, in fact? What is the secret of this message? What and in which way, after having this cosmology, one God creating this, this creation and human being and asking human beings, now you have to liberate yourself from your own self, your own ego, to come to me and to come to respecting and celebrating and understanding the very meaning of this uh, uh, universe chanting and praising God. 
that everything on earth is praising God. It's there is there, there is a, a, a there are chanting here and what you are trying to do out of your education is come to this understanding, this deep understanding of respecting the creation and respecting the creator through your respect towards the creation. So this means what? In order to do this, there is one journey that you have to do and that you have to experience. It's coming back to your own self. And this is important. Why? Because what we find in Islam is he created all the creation and us and he put in our heart a spark. That he created and he put a spark in fitra, which is that Allah created us with a spark, a light, which is this natural aspiration towards transcendence. That you will find with people who have nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Christianity or Judaism or Islam, there is something which is what we understand as the quest for this answer, as I said at the beginning, why am I here? So you find this everywhere. When you find humanity, there is this question, why are we here? When there is consciousness, there is this question. So this is what we call il fitra. Il fitra. So what we have to do as believers is to go through this journey and to come back to the natural fitra, this aspiration, and to get this meaning of life through the presence of God. This is a personal education, which means, in fact, that you have to come back to the origin. And everything in Islam, once again, has to do with this. In fact, your journey towards him is to come back to yourself. So, sanurihim ayatina fil wa fi anfusim. We'll show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves. So, go and come back to yourself. Come back to your heart. The, the key of your own liberation is your heart. This is why you come back to the very origin of your nature, but not the nature that is destroyed, the nature where there is light. Who is the one who is going to be saved? What we find in the Quran, إِلَّا مَنْ أَطَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Those who are going to be lost are forgetting themselves, except those who are coming back to God with the heart of the origin. الْقَلْبِ salim is the pure heart of the origin with al fitra, with this natural aspiration. All this, this natural, this spiritual journey, coming back to our nature, not the nature that could corrupt, but the nature that is connected to God, which is to come to the self beneath the ego. This is what we have to do. This is the spiritual journey, which has as a meaning a liberation process, liberating <coughs> ourselves. So, Coming back to the source and this journey, how are you going to call it? And this is where uh, we have a big problem in the Islamic tradition, and you'll see why. In fact, this path, this way, contrary to all what we see now and what is said about Sharia, understood as God's law, in fact, if you come back to the Quran, you get the very understanding of what Sharia means. In fact, there is only one time where Sharia is used as Sharia in the Quran, which is ثم جعلناك على شريعة من الأمر فاتبعها. Then we put you on a way, and you have to follow it. Follow the way, and what is the way? Is the very essence of the message, and the very essence of the message is, your way is to come back to me. When someone passes away, we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raja'un. We belong to God, and to God we shall return. That's the very essence of our life, and this is what we have to do, even with our own self. Coming back to us, to our self, in order to find again this relationship to God. And this relationship to God is, as I said, a liberating process. So now I'm going to explain how we can do this and, and why we need to do this from uh, an Islamic perspective. So, when it comes to Sharia, when it comes to this path that we have to follow, uh, what you need to, to understand is, is at the end, what are you trying to achieve? 
And this is where the Sufi tradition was right by saying to the fuqaha, the jurist, the Muslim jurist, be careful. It's right that we have to pray five times a day. It's right that we have to fast. It's right that we have to pay zakat. It's right that we have to avoid what is prohibited. It's right that we have to do and to perform the obligations. All these is right. But tell us, why? Why are we doing this? Is it only to do it because we are asked to do it? Or is there a higher objective to what we are doing? When in the Quran it is said, you have to pray to remember me, you may ask me to pray, but don't forget to remember him. So in fact, you need to get the objectives to understand the means. All the rituals are means, be careful not to make the means, the goals. Because this is where we are lost. In fact, when you start confusing between the means and the goals, this is the starting point of a shirk in Islam, which is to put something else instead of God in all what you are doing. The final goal of everything at the end is what? Why are we following the Prophet, peace be upon him? Why are we trying to, to perform, to pray? What are we trying to achieve? What is going to liberate us from our own ego to come close to him. What? We have it in one of the verses of the Quran, which is the very deep understanding of the spiritual thing, the spiritual educating yourself in order to manage and to control yourself in order to come close to him. This is the spiritual journey to do with. To do what? In kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhibbukum Allah. If you love him, follow me. You will be loved by him. At the end, it's a love story. The liberation process has to do if you love him, so if you are understanding the very meaning. Why do you pray? Just to obey a rule or to express a specific loving relationship to him? What are you trying to achieve? The final objective, it's love. It's to be loved by him. And to be loved by him is what? Is to go through this path. But the path has to do with something which is essential. At every stage of your journey, never forget the meaning of things. The meaning of means and the meanings of goals. Never forget that. This is the spiritual journey that you have. To, so the meaning here is until in a, a spiritual, intellectual and physical liberation process that you keep the meaning everywhere in order to know what you are doing. Why is it important? Why are you studying? Because you are trying to get some understanding of the world. The meaning that you are going to get is going to help you to be intellectually autonomous. So education is about liberation, intellectual liberation. This is what we are talking about here. So everything in that way should be understood. Uh, uh, in that way. So, the scholars, when they started talking about this, uh, the first Islamic scholars was fiqh, Islamic law and jurisprudence. Then you had people thinking, okay, if we have Islamic law and jurisprudence, it's very important to do two things. First, to extract from the scriptural sources the methodology from which and, and uh, through which we can get the law and get the jurisprudence. So this is where Usul al-Fiqh uh, 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 came after Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh is the fundamentals through which we can extract the rules from the Quran in order to get also the objectives. How, why are we doing what we are doing? So it's to give meanings to the rules. And the scholars started, started, started trying to organize what are the main objectives in Islam. And they were talking about five main objectives uh, in Islam. Talking about the deen, its religion. Talking about uh, the intellect. We, we have to protect uh, religion. We have to protect the intellect. We have to protect the personal integrity. We have to protect quality. And we have to protect our goods. And uh, Al-Qarafi later said we have to protect our dignity. So they try, they try to understand, okay, in order to get God's uh, love and get proximity and acceptance of who we are, we need to protect all the things. 
And at the end, that's a problem, because if you look at the world today, with so uh, 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 global and uh, overall objectives, if you come to the reality today, it's very far from the objective that we need to get in every sense. We need to get something much more specific in economy, in, in all in human sciences. These are two uh, uh, general goals, and this is what we are trying to do now. Many scholars are now coming in every field to try to say what are the ultimate ethical goals. And there are scholars saying, and, and this is also something which is important coming out of the message, in fact, if you read the message, there are two things that you have to protect first. First, of course, coming from a religious perspective, you have to protect your religion. So, in order to have a dignified life as a believer, there is something that it's, has to do with your belief. So, you protect a deen, religion. But there is also something that was very deep in our tradition. If you read the Quran and the prophetic tradition, what is also important is that you have to protect maslahat al nas. Maslaha was translated into English as general or public interest. And in fact, it's not exactly right. If you read the Quran carefully, it's not only the general interest or the public interest, it's the public ethical interest. There is an ethical dimension in the interest. It's not a utilitarian interest that you are protecting, it's ethical. So there is something which is called good and something which is called bad. The public interest is to protect the good for the society. And the ethical dimension, it's not only the rules. So this is part of the, the discussion that we have here when it comes to uh, the higher objective. And there are, after this, other objectives that we need to discuss. And they were not always there uh, at the beginning of the Islamic sciences, for example. There is one which is important that we now understand how, it is, how much it is important. It's life. And life meaning what? The protection of life is not only the life of human beings. It's life. Everything and every being which is alive within the creation has to get the human respect animals, species, whatever. Life. So creation has to do with life. It's not us and then them. No, it's life within the whole thing. So this is why even our, I remember that uh, uh, Pierre Barak, it's, it's a sociologist who was telling me, he's coming from the Hindu tradition, saying, for us when you speak about the environment, it's problematic because it's as if we are the center and the environment is around us. We don't have this perception of the creation. Uh, even the creation is not. So he was putting another perspective in the way we have to deal with the creation. And from an Islamic perspective, yes, we are responsible of the creation, but we are not the center. Life is even beyond the way we are dealing with our own self, that we have to respect the sacrality of life. And this is something that we have to respect. And then with life, there is something which is also the environment now that we are dealing with, which is nature is also something that we have to protect, because part of our survival is to protect nature. And the third one, which is an essential value in Islam, is in fact peace. It's an essential value, and we have to protect peace as an ultimate higher objective. But get me right. Peace is not to sit down here and say, you know what, I'm a peaceful woman or I'm a peaceful man. It's deeper than that. Peace <coughs> has conditions. And you need to get peace has to do with liberation. Peace with your own self. Peace with nature. Peace with your neighbor. And starting with peace with God. Peace, Salam, is the name of God, is the name of paradise, and is within the very root of Islam. You will go have no peace with yourself if you don't liberate yourself from your ego. You are not going to get any peace with your neighbor if you don't master the way you deal with the people. Generosity, solidarity. So when you start the discussion from the spiritual uh, background and you understand that this has to do with uh, with uh, 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 the cosmology and the very essence of the Islamic message, 
You don't start with a uh, liberation theology which is only, okay, let us look at injustices in the world. No, look at yourself. And then yourself, look at humanity. Know what it takes now to go through this liberation process. And it's okay. very demanding at your level and at the level of the society. So, uh, first, what is the starting point of everything and especially in, for us today, we live in uh, our societies today, we live in the West, we live in the, in the globalized world, the starting point of the spiritual message, which is the eternal and permanent message, the spiritual message that we are going ev to find everywhere. And this is why in the question that I had, in which way we can collaborate with people of other faiths, this is the universal teaching of our intimacy, our, our intimate reality which has to do free yourself from your own jails. And what do you have to do? What are the first elements that you have to deal with? Just look at yourself and try to identify anything which has to do with your own addiction and dependence. Addictions is the starting point. To what are you addicted? What is in your heart? What is in your mind? What is in your body? that at one point you can say, there I can identify something which has to do with addiction. The opposition or the opposite of liberation is just to go through <coughs> addictions and to accept them as if they are natural. Yes, addictions could be natural. Spirituality has to do with free yourself from any type of addiction. When God is calling you to come to Him, He wants you, he wants you to be free from all addictions. So it could be your ego, it could be your desires, it could be your anything that you can just think about. It's psychological, it's intellectual, uh, and uh, 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 emotional, and cultural, even cultural. So when you say, you know, cultures are, and this is also something that we have to deal with when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the way we deal with uh, the cultural dimension of our being. Well, for example, I'm saying, you know, I'm a Western Muslim, so my, the European culture is my culture. Does it mean that, for example, I have to take from my culture everything? And if you come from the Arab culture, if you come from Saudi Arabia, the center of, or the so-called center, at this is the geographical center is no longer a center for anything, anyway. So, <laughs> the center, if you come from there, with the art culture, and you try to deal with it. You can see in any culture produced by human beings, you can see dependencies, you can see addictions, you can see things that are ethically to be questioned, so there is no cultural belonging without a critical thinking about belonging to a culture. If not, you are going to produce dependence, addiction, and then no liberation. We need to get through this process. So the discussion about culture or cultures, it's something that has to be critical. So we need to get a critical take on anything which is cultural. But also exactly the same with emotions. All the things that you have in the psychological studies from psychoanalysis to what, for example, you can find with uh, Jung in anything which has to do with this uh, historical uh, 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 dimension of our building of our personality. It means that you have to deal with this to understand at one point you are free from your own legacy, your own heritage. That's also something which is quite important. You cannot just say, I'm coming from there, and so what? <coughs> and so what? What does it mean that you are coming from? In which way you are autonomous, in the way you think, in the way you feel, and in the way you build? That's a very strong uh, uh, statement when it comes to dealing with your own self and trying to uh, uh, deal with uh, all the dimensions. So I repeat, there is something in our own self which has to do with what are your intellectual addictions or dependencies? And even if you are, for example, you are in Oxford, then you can think that this is the place where you are thinking freely. Are you sure? Are you sure, for example, that what is presented to you as objectivity or sciences are truly sciences? 
So the methodology that you are using are also to be questioned and to know is this coming from a specific culture in the way I'm using my rationality? When Dostoevsky is saying two plus two might make five, that's interesting. Because he's saying that be careful with the logic that you think is so obvious that you take it for granted and you end up not thinking about what is presented to you as science and that can be something which is more ideological than scientific. So are you questioning this? Are you questioning the methodologies? Are you questioning the epistemology? And when we speak about the epistemology is from where and how do you get the knowledge that you have? So this is something which is a critical thinking that is the starting point of uh, the liberation process. And if you say that uh, 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 you believe in God and he's asking you to come back to the source and the origin and to free yourself from your ego and anything which has to do with intellectual, physical, cultural, emotional dependence, come to me free, you have to question all this. So no spirituality without critical thinking, without this liberation process. No spirituality without this. So anyone who's saying, I'm spiritual, I don't think so much. <laughs> okay. Except for those people who can be connected to God and, and in a very simple way. I'm talking here about the process of what I'm speaking about when it comes to the liberation process. Okay, now, it means that the second step it's to understand that uh, all the sciences that we have are but means, only means. So nothing, so the knowledge that we are trying to get is, is there are means to achieve what? In this cosmology, everything that we are trying to get as knowledge should help us to do what? To protect our religion, yes, to protect our general ethical interests, so anything has to do is, I'm trying to get knowledge, to use this knowledge for the good. So all the discussion that we had in the Middle Ages in, in, in Europe was saying, is religion controlling science or should we control? We, have, we should refuse this. Religions should not control knowledge. Knowledge is to try to get the understanding of things the way they are. So no censorship, no control. And on this, I, 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 I wrote my first PhD on Nietzsche's philosophy. What he was considering as a scandal was really a scandal. Just to say, for example, that science is against faith, or reason is against faith, or knowledge, remember, for example, even up to the the French philosopher Pascal, Max Pascal, saying we have to write again those who are pushing sciences too far. We never push sciences too far. What we push too far is less consciousness when we have more knowledge. And why do we have <coughs> consciousness? Is to question the very goal of our means. Why are you trying to know what you are trying to know? This is a central question. And today, talking with the philosopher Edgar Morin, he said, we have a big problem in all what we are doing when it comes to knowledge, is this fragmentation of knowledge. The knowledge are becoming goals in themselves, and they are not means for common good. Uh, the goals are not questioned. So what we have to do when it comes to understand all the knowledges, all the sciences, should help us to liberate ourselves from our own alienation. So they should be means to higher goal, ethical goal that we have to put. So we have the right and we have the duty to come to question all the sciences, not in the methodology that I use to get the knowledge, but the goals that are uh, uh, set to use the knowledge. This is where we need to do this. And in our schools today, at all the levels, up to here in the university, we need to question what are the goals, what are the higher objectives of what we are trying to get as the knowledge that we, we need to have here. And uh, I would say, no imposition on rationality, but the right question is, how do we use our rationality when it comes to 
any knowledge mm -hmm. as part of the, the liberation process. So this is also something which is uh, essential in our discussion on liberation theology. And the liberation theology is not to behave or not to act or not to consider that knowledge is wrong. No, knowledge is never wrong. Knowledge is good. Now it's the way we are using and this is why we have in the <coughs> Islamic tradition that we are asking us uh, we are asking God to provide us with useful knowledge. And the useful knowledge is in which way we are going to uh, achieve this liberation process to use the knowledge for the good and to serve him to the way we are dealing with uh, uh, this knowledge. 